Dustin Baker, Vikes now, the March 27th edition. We are about four weeks away from the NFL draft, and I want to do a comprehensive A to Z recap <clears throat> on free agency today because we have two weeks in the books. That does not mean that more dudes won't be signed. During the third week last year, Patrick Peterson reunited with the Vikings. Chris Reed came aboard. Ty Smith came aboard. And is it was it Tay Gowan? There was dudes that showed up in week three of free agency. The ones that had an impact were Peterson, obviously, and then to an extent down the stretch, Chris Reed. So free agency isn't over, but the big splashy stuff probably is, unless there's an OBJ signing on the way or a Lamar Jackson trade. He formally announced that he requested a trade 25 days ago from the Ravens, and he doesn't want to work there anymore. So the Vikings are there in the sweepstakes, th theoretically, to land Jackson um, because, hey, we have a quarterback that is not under contract through – or not under contract in 2024, meaning this year could be his last year, and if they wanted to kickstart this Jackson era or just a, a non-Cousins era, getting Jackson for only two first-rounders would be a supreme way to do it. That is really cheap for a guy of his caliber. Uh, we'll talk more about that if it becomes more real. Right now, it's just theories on where he could land. There's no credible source that says, oh yeah, Vikings are in talks to get Jackson. But I digress. So we're going to talk about every single move from Vikings free agency. This episode will go a little bit longer than most, but I'll do my best to summarize succinctly each move. Let's go through the guys that aren't working here anymore, that aren't coming back anytime soon. Foremost, Eric Kendricks went to the Los Angeles Chargers, his stomping grounds. You know that he played at UCLA along with Anthony Barr. And Kendricks will, will start, unless something funky happens, for the Chargers. An old Vikings coach, Jeff Howard, is the linebackers coach there. He was a defensive assistant for the Vikings during the Zimmer era. And so Kendricks gets to rekindle his career on the West Coast. Everybody knows Adam Thielen. He left, what, two and a half weeks ago? Signed with the Panthers. Last, or uh, what, eight days ago, Sunday, where he says he's going to try to win a Super Bowl and that Andy Dalton was a big wooing factor. Got news for him. Dalton's not going to start there for too long after C.J. Stroud or Bryce Young or Anthony Richardson is selected in Carolina. But you do you, Mr. Thielen. Hopefully he uh, gets a lot of targets, a lot of catches, and maybe even sniffs the playoffs with those Panthers. <clears throat> One of the most surprising ones that's not terribly impactful was Cameron Dantzler was waived by the Vikings, and then the Commanders picked him up off the waiver wire and are now on the hook for his contract. Uh, and Dantzler leaving in, in the grand scheme of Vikings life isn't that big of a deal, but it's weird because Minnesota has really skimpy cornerback depth right now with Andrew Booth, Byron Murphy, and Caleb Evans, and then the guys who won't start like Kalon Barnes and Tay Gowan. Um, there, Dantzler wasn't crazy expensive. He was still on his rookie contract. So to electively say the hell with yous, goodbye, was weird because Dantzler is the type of depth cornerback that you want. But it doesn't matter anymore because he plays for Washington. He ain't coming back either. Dalvin Tomlinson would have been a nice commodity to re-sign in the guts of the Vikings defense. But he fetched four years and $57 million from the Browns, which I am glad the Vikings didn't match or get anywhere close to it because although Tomlinson is awesome, he's not worth that in the middle of the defense. And Kairos Tonga, who I'll talk about in five, ten minutes, uh, he's, he's, he's in the house for 940000 baby, and he's not as good as Tomlinson. But he did have it a surprisingly good year in 2022. We shall see if he's the starting nose tackle or if somebody else comes aboard. But Tomlinson goes to Stefanski land. Duke Shelley. This one I do not understand. I could do a whole show about my grievances here. Now, I understand that Duke Shelley may have been lightning in a bottle. Fine. I get it. He popped up for one season, and now the rest of the world will scheme so that he can be exposed or something like that. Um, but he ended up with the Raiders for one year and $1.3 million. We will all be vindicated in a 10, 11 months if Shelley goes back to a blasé 50.0 PFF score, is a non-factor, and is on the bench by week eight with the Raiders. That'll be fine. 
And we'll be like, all right, well, Quazy got it right. But here's the deal. The guy played so well in 2022 out of nowhere that at a $1.3 million price point, he deserved a sequel so that the Vikings could figure out if he's the real deal. He wasn't asking for $5 million. If you give him that contract and then he flops, then you're like, oh boy, how do we not see this coming? But Shelley asked for a miniature deal, and he, he deserved that from the Vikings. And if he flops, you're out $1.3 million, life goes on. So my grievance is not that Shelley is going to go light it up for some other team, with that jealousy factor, it's that at that small price point, why couldn't it have been the Vikings who said, yeah, let's see if you can do this in Flores' defense too. And then finally on departures, at least for now, is Patrick Peterson. As Mike Tomlin came over from the Pittsburgh Steelers to run the Vikings' defense in 2023, Patrick Peterson went the other way. Two ships passing in the night, Peterson went to the Steelers, and I guess he can chase Super Bowls with uh, Kenny Pickett. Kenny Pickett looks like he's going to be pretty good, but I don't know that with Peterson, who says he's playing for two more years, if that's really going to be a timetable where the Steelers are contenders once again. As for everything, we shall see. <clears throat> All right, these men were re-signed. Garrett Bradbury, there was a lot of off-season mystery about whether or not the Vikings would commit to him. They got him for a pretty damn cheap deal. What is it, 5.7 mil per year? And it's basically another one-year prove-it deal to see if he stays at that level of 2022 Bradbury and not that mess that we saw via pass protection from 2019 to 2021. He's back. The Vikings don't have to draft a high-round center now, although if they end up trading a bunch and getting 7 to 10 draft packs, draft picks, excuse me, they could take a flyer on a center from rounds 3, 4, or 5 where centers should be got in the first place. Blake Brandle's back. He's a depth tackle. He was one of the first free agent moves uh, re-signed. Jonathan Bullard was surprising because, in my opinion, he's kind of a placeholder defensive tackle. Doesn't suck. Isn't elite. Is just kind of okay. And evidently, he's going to come back and have a summer camp battle with Dean Lowry, I presume, who another guy I'll touch on shortly. Bullard's back. I didn't foresee that one. Shame on me. Andrew DePaula, the long snapper, he returns. Ben Ellison, the tight end in a very crowded Vikings tight end room that consists of TJ Hawkinson, Josh Oliver, Ellison, Nick Muse, and who's the other one? Damn it. Oh, my goodness. I'm forgetting one of them. Uh, Johnny Munt. Uh, so I'm going to guess that Hawkinson, Oliver, and Munt make the team and then Muse to the practice squad. I don't know about Ellison, but he's back for some reason. C.J. Ham returning for two more years was a real stunner to me because the Vikings hardly used him on offense. He was a special teams guru. Bless his heart. We're glad to have him back, but it's really weird that they're going to pay – uh, or they, they were on deck to pay Ham $3 million for a player who really isn't utilized on offense. But the Vikings will remain one of the teams that employs fullbacks, last of a dying breed. Greg Joseph is your kicker in 2023. I don't think they're – maybe. Maybe they'll find an undrafted kicker to have some competition. Um, but we're going to do this Joseph offseason thing where we hope he can figure out his special – or his extra point stuff – uh, basically, I've said it three or four times on this show, Joseph was great when the game was on the line and was not very good other than that compared to the rest of the kickers in the NFL. Alexander Madison, a running back, is back for two years and $8 million. And this one is really, really fascinating because it has Dalvin Cook implications. If you're going to pay Madison starting running back money, which this day and age really is the contract that Madison got, He's going to be the RB1 in a committee that involves Ty Chandler, Kane and Wongu, and maybe even a running back from the draft in April. But it kind of leaves Cook as the odd man out. And I think that's why there's so many trade Cook rumors, whether that's to the Falcons, to the Bills, CBS Sports said the Bengals and Ravens. I would expect a Dalvin Cook trade to happen specifically because Madison is in the house for two more years. Otherwise, you have the analytics-focused general manager, Kwesi Dafamensa, paying a running back room about $20 million per season, which is very anti-analytics-focused. Nick Mullins, QB2, the reason that that one's noteworthy is he was signed for two years, which means if the Vikings indeed draft a quarterback in this draft or next year's draft, Mullins could be the patch-over guy. I don't know if that lights your fire, but it could be on the way. Austin Schlotman will be back for backup center duty. Um, next to Garrett Bradbury. Kyrus Tonga, he'll get a shot at being the new uh, Dalvin Tomlinson. Uh, Sheldon Day is also on the practice squad or 
whatever you consider the practice squad right now during the offseason. Uh, but Tonga looked great in 2022. He has that Shelly opportunity to prove that he was more than just a one-hit wonder. Oli Udo, some of us thought that he could go be a fringe starting right tackle on a different team, but nope, he's back with the Vikings for a fifth season, and that's great depth. Anytime that guy comes in to play tackle when somebody else is hurt, it works great. It really does. We're all scarred by the 2021 experiment, the Zimmer special, moving his, moving his ass to guard and then having penalties galore. It was miserable. And then Kenny Willekes is back. Uh, he's a guy that was drafted in 2020 that just flat out never plays because he's hurt. But evidently, they have special plans for him, and he will be a summer depth edge rushing piece. The newcomers, the fun stuff, Josh Oliver, blocking tight ends, three years, 21 million. Sticker shock looks m like a little bit more gruesome than the actual deal if you pull, uh, pull back the curtain. It's really not that much guaranteed money, but it was very weird that the very first signing of Vikings free agency was a tight end when we you know we're good there, folks. We don't need any more, but they're evidently going to revamp the offense, feature two tight ends more often or more often, and then run the football. The Vikings ranked third to last in rush play percentage and re-signing C.J. Ham, plus going to get a run blocking tight end in Oliver really shows that somebody in the room, and Egan said, look, fellas, we got to run the ball. I know you're a former, former quarterback, Mr. O'Connell, but we got to run the football every now and then. Oliver points to that actually happening in 2023. My favorite signing of the offseason is Marcus Davenport. There's not a whole lot of enthusiasm over the Vikings fan base uh, about him. I've tweeted out polls about, you know, what's the the biggest offseason move, and everybody says Byron Murphy, which is fine and dandy, but if Zadarius Smith leaves the Vikings, you need another edge rusher in the modern NFL. You can't just say, all right, we got Patrick Jones, DJ Wanham. We're going to be fine. Patrick Jones looked pretty damn good last year, but you leave a lot to chance if you're going to start him in week one. Uh, but Davenport, that gets rid of all the reservations because he has the freakish physical pass rushing talent to be an excellent partner for Daniil Hunter. And he's also one year, 13 million on a prove it deal. Uh, let's hope that he gets more than 0 0.5 sacks, which was the knock on him last year. Byron Murphy, was desperately needed uh, at cornerback, and I thought they would have more cornerbacks by now or perhaps just re-sign Shelley or don't cut Cameron Dantzler because no, other, no matter how you dice it, the Vikings cornerback right now, cornerback room is really scary because there's not enough dudes, and if this continues the next four weeks, you bet your ass they're going to draft the cornerback really early in the draft. Dean Lowry, a Packer turncoat. Seems like every offseason we have at least one dude that crosses the interstate from Wisconsin and plays for the Vikings. This gent will be a defensive tackle in the Bullard role or the Shamar Stevens role, and we shall see between Mr. Bullard and Mr. Lowry who wins the camp battle. Based on resumes, when you put them next to each other, it's probably going to be Lowry. So the latest in a humongous line of Packer defections, Dean Lowry joined the Minnesota Vikings. And then these other two ones that are don't move the needle a whole lot, Brandon Powell, yes, that guy who returned a punt return for a touchdown against the Vikings in that awful loss at U.S. Bank Stadium December 2021. Yeah, he has one career punt, punt return touchdown. It was against those Vikings, and now he comes aboard as a WR5 type, maybe WR6, and will push Jalen Rager to the limit for punt returning duties. And a little, little secret is that Rager wasn't very good at those last year, although we had hope the entire season that he'd bust out and, you know, this is why we traded for this guy. No cigar, at least not yet. And then uh, Troy Reeder, a linebacker from Rams fame, transplanted to the Chargers last year. He's an O'Connell guy. They worked, they won a Super Bowl together in 2021. And this is a guy that probably will be a depth linebacker unless he has some trick up his sleeve to dethrone Jordan Hicks. Uh, yeah, Reader from the Rams. Getting the gang back together. Same thing with Brandon Powell. And verdicts are still out on these guys who were with the Vikings last year that still need new homes. Chris Boyd, he recently flirted with the Giants, talking about a free agent relationship there. No deal yet. B.C. Johnson, you know, about a week ago, he chatted with the Patriots. Could land there, probably not back with the Vikings. The biggest name on the list, Irv Smith, all because he was number one in your heart for, what, three three or four straight off seasons. There's no room on 
the Vikings anymore for Irv Smith, especially when you're paying Hawkinson and Oliver. But I predict Irv Smith will sign with the Saints. His hometown, that's where his dad started his career. The Saints just lost Foster Moreau to that awful cancer diagnosis. This guy predicts the Saints, and it's not that bold of a prediction. And then Chandon Sullivan, last year's slot cornerback, who was deprived of two fumble return touchdowns against the Colts. Um, there doesn't seem like there's any priority to bring him back. And, yeah, you're basically looking at all these Vikings cornerbacks l- leaving the team. Patrick Peterson, Duke Shelley, Cameron Dantzler, Chandon Sullivan, with only one guy coming through the outdoor, and that is Byron Murphy. So something's got to give with cornerbacks. I think that's probably the theme of this episode. And then not a free agent move, but on the whole, probably the most important offseason decision outside of Brian Flores as the defensive coordinator was the decision or lack thereof not to extend Kirk Cousins beyond this year. They could still do it. I could go post this show to YouTube, and 30 seconds later, boom, Kirk Cousins has you know, been given an extension by the Vikings, but it probably would have happened by now, which means if you want to get somebody in in the room while Cousins is still a QB1 and get them marinating, developing, progressing, then you might have to draft a quarterback in this draft. And the more that I study this topic, and I mean, I've studied it for my entire football life, yeah, it's fine and fun to say, oh, yeah, we'll take a flyer on Kellen Mond in the third round, or we'll just get Clayton Toon in round five or six. Those guys don't ever really work out. You hear about the ones that do, whether it's Prescott, Cousins, or Brady, but most of the time, the guys that are picked after about the fourth or fifth quarterback off the board, you never hear from them again. So I think, based on what I know of Kwesi Adafa doings to date, I'm going to guess that in this draft or the next is when he makes a splash to go get his cousin's successor. I don't think they're going to just try out some, you know, Jaron Hall in round four or even Hendon Hooker, maybe Hendon Hooker in round three. I don't see the Vikings reaching to 23, which has been all the buzz in the past seven days. But I truly think we're setting ourselves up for this quarterback climax where Kwesi and Mr. O'Connell identify Will Levis or somehow getting the C.J. Stroud sweepstakes. They do something really bold, and I'm going to do a show on this, Trade Partners, sometime this week or next, and jump up on the board to get their guy. I think that's the only way to do it uh, because we know that the Vikings in their current semblance, the roster, they're probably not going to be bad. You might want them to because you're a a rebuild soul, uh, but I think the bottom floor for the way the roster looks is probably – eight and nine, seven and 10, if things go pear-shaped. I mean, that's the worst that Cousins bring to the table. And then you're looking at the 16th overall pick. Is that really going to be that much better in 2024 than what you have right now? So I think whether it is four weeks from now or a year and four weeks from now, the Minnesota Vikings will have to trade up to get their quarterback of the future if they don't get involved in this Lamar Jackson sweepstakes. A whole lot of shit coming on that, talking about the quarterback stuff, because it will be the most pivotal moment in Vikings history since Teddy Bridgewater's injury. It'll be which guy do they pick? How does Kevin O'Connell develop him? If it doesn't go well, you can kiss O'Connell's job goodbye. Quasi probably survives. But yeah, and then if let's say that happens. Let's say we draft Anthony Richardson. And the guy sucks. His accuracy, lo and behold, mattered in college, and he can't translate to the NFL. Well, that means about four years from now, you, me, everybody in the Vikings community is going to be scouring the free agent market to figure out which quarterback we can get who has a documented resume so we don't have to swing and miss like we did on Anthony Richardson or something like that. That's how we got Cousins. It's all, you know, it's repeatable. Um, when you keep striking out in the draft, like the Vikings had numerous times in franchise history, you prefer a sure thing and something you know, and that's that's why they always they get Randall Cunningham, Jeff George, just squeezing the prime out of these veterans. And then in Cousins' case in 2018, it was one of the rare times that a productive passer gets on the market. So what they do? They said, well, we're going to – we're going to get a guy that we know throws 4,000 yards per season and see what we can do with this defensive mastermind in Zimmer. And then it didn't work because, in my opinion, Zimmer didn't really care about having a quarterback who could fling the ball over the field. He still wanted to run the ball, play defense, keep the score about 21-7, and get out of dodge. Uh, but, yes, more quarterback chats between myself and you guys and gals are on the way. We'll chat about them in no time. But for now, skull, baby.